Very good, very good, very good. So one, one person was listening and he won a kayak trip. <laughs> Let's try it again. Okay, once again, if I raise one arm, that's the speaker is go coming to an end, and so he has time and opportunity to finish the sentence. Please clap with just one finger. Try it again. Very good. What is the sound of one finger clapping? And if I do this, then you go frenetic. Great, 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 great. Now I have optimized my jokes, so we have to spend less time on them. It only takes one German to change a light bulb. We are efficient, not funny. Our first speaker, Larry Hastings. <laughs> My life as a meme. Give him a big hand. Okay, this has nothing to do with Python. Um, this is one of my other hobbies. This is called speedrunning. Speedrunning is where you play a video game, usually an older classic video game, and the whole goal is to get from beginning to the very end of the game as fast as possible. And it almost doesn't matter what you do as long as you're getting the game done. Um, if the game has built-in cheats, you're not allowed to use those, but if the game has bugs or glitches, you can absolutely exploit those. So here, this is a speedrunner named Yuchi. Um, she is playing Ape Escape for the original Sony PlayStation, and she's using an infinite jump glitch to just fly over the entire level and go straight to the exit. Um, Speedrunning really hit its stride with the invention of Twitch and uh, live streaming. And so she's got 50 people watching her play the same video game over and over and over for like eight hours a day. Um, Speedrunning is really uh, the domain of the young. It requires a lot of time devotion in order to get good enough to be interesting to watch. And so these people, they just play the video game and when they finish, they start over again. They just do it over and over and over for hours a day, days at a, at a time. So. Um, there is now a yearly speedrunning marathon. It's done twice a year. Um, the first one is AGDQ, and that's in January. Um, AGDQ 2016, uh, first week of January this year. Uh, that stands for Awesome Games Done Quick. It's a week-long, 24-hour-a-day marathon streaming people playing video games for charity, and they're all very good, and it's just mesmerizing to watch how they can abuse these games. And it's, uh, it's, it gets over 100,000 bored teenagers sitting and watching the stream as it goes by. Now. Um, here is uh, a, a screenshot of AGDQ from this year. This is uh, Chris LBC playing Spyro 1, and you can see there's a camera pointed at uh, Chris while he's playing it. There's the main screen, and there's also the Twitch chat, which is going by. It's just a text chat thing with a lot of uh, emoticons and things. Um, now, this year I decided to go to AGDQ, even though I don't actually speedrun. I'm no good at it. Um, and they have, uh, it takes them a lot of time to switch between games because they need to switch consoles and all this stuff. And so they have a camera that they just point at the audience. Um, and uh, so there's 100,000 people sitting there watching this camera uh, that's pointed at people. And a lot of time there was nobody sitting there. And so I was like, well, somebody should sit there. So I just went up and sat in the front. And I would start playing my video game unit. Um, you can see I'm, I'm right there on the stream right now. Um, it's, it's this, it's called a, a Pandora. It's for uh, uh, old school gaming. So I kept doing this, sitting in front of 100,000 bored teenagers, and something strange started happening. So someone came out from the, the, the show, and they, uh, they said, you know they're talking about you on the stream. And I said, sure, that's fine. And then somebody else came out and said, could you wave to the camera? They'd really like that. <laughs> OK. And the guy came out and said, people are donating in your name. Where would you like those donations to go? <laughs> And finally, they said, what are you playing? I was like, well, it's, it's this. So it turned out um, the 100,000 board teenagers had given me a nickname. I was now DS Dad. The <laughs> they thought this was a DS, which is not. And I had gray hair, so I looked like a dad, which I'm not. Um, so it was completely inaccurate. But it was a hashtag on Twitter. If you search for DS Dad, you'll find all these people talking about me. They were posting these love letters. <laughs> they were drawing pictures of me. That one's my favorite, the sort of <laughs> low tech. I don't know if you've ever had 100,000 bored teenagers talking about how much they love you, but it's a really strange experience. <laughs> I had people stopping me in the hall for pictures. One guy asked me to sign his Nintendo 64 controller. He was, very, he was more excited about me than the world champion at Mario 64. Um, 
initially I thought this was kind of annoying, but honestly, everyone was being pretty respectful, and it was all for charity, and so I was like, ah, okay, that's fine. So uh, two weeks ago was SGDQ, Summer Games Done Quick, um, held in Minneapolis, and I went to that. Um, this is the Spyro 3 any percent race. Uh, this was Orsa and Wed C running, and you can barely sort of make me out, but I got to sit on the couch and do color commentary. And during the race, of course, there's the Twitch chat scrolling by, and they're like, oh, yes, Dad, he's on the couch. <laughs> so I don't know if you want to watch that. Um, there's a link to, uh, you can watch the stream go by. It's like nine hours into a Twitch recording. Um, uh, Speedrunning is really fun to watch. It's even more fun to do um, if you have a lot of time to devote for it. And maybe I'll go to AGDQ in 2017, and uh, they can all love DS Dad again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. <laughs> Wonderful stories. Thank you so much. That remembers me uh, when I was even younger. I was giving seminars, and it was about sending emails. And so at the beginning of the seminar, I asked the guys, what is your computer knowledge? And one guy told me, I know Zelda. I played it totally. That was his computer knowledge. <laughs> Very good. Now we have as next speaker Xavier Domingo about Python XP exclamation mark. Experience. Ah, cool. Python experience, Xavier Domingo. Give him a big hand. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, okay, who I am? Uh, basically, I have done everything related to electronics, but I'm not doing that for my work, job, or day-to-day -day work. Uh, I have done a lot of side projects. I have done uh, a lot of embedded code and stuff like that. Uh, the most thing I could put was that I reviewed a book. And I have no images in the presentation. I have no idea how to make a presentation, so don't expect me too much from me. Um, I wanted to basically share what I have learned on the, I have been coming, uh, this is my third year in a row since I discovered EuroPython. Uh, Lightning talks for me are like the very best because you actually get to learn a lot of things about Python that are like known to everyone but you. So I started on the university, I, I had like my, well, I kind of read a lot of RFCs and stuff like that and I started to backport an Nginx module for, I don't remember what, and that was like super nice. Then I went to a uh, phone, I started coding with Python, we, uh, I took, uh, we took a MobDB, which is an open source project and basically forked it to make a product. I uh, have done a lot of embedded systems there, all join, I, there I learned how to basically link what you do in C with Python. Uh, it's uh, really hard <laughs> to use C because it has like a lot of things going on at the same time. Then I tried to install OpenStack, that was like, don't do it. Uh, Kubernetes, that was actually easier, I, I didn't know how to use it but I could install it. And uh, then I started with Spark and stuff like that. It, it was actually, well, of course, this was a long three years, so I could actually, at the end, I was better at uh, Python. Then I started on uh, Mosaic. I did a lot of C development. I didn't use Python for a while, but that was like a superb introduction to AsyncIO. If you, anyone is lost in AsyncIO, well, uh, this is not a good thing to say, but you can start by C you code in C and then you see how to backport things to Python. And that actually gave me a lot of background on how uh, not to access files or sockets. And now I'm on Jin, uh, it's everything Python everywhere. And if it's not, I put Python there. And uh, we're using, I didn't know, I didn't want to make a enormous list, so I just put that, everything. Uh, Okay, so the first thing I learned when I started with open source in 2009 was that every software has a bug waiting for me, always. I, I always find something that is like, oh, you found a bug, or it's not documented, or this is a feature. So anyway, I, I had to keep uh, getting into like, first you go into Google, then you go into the mailing lists, and then you start reading the code. Uh, so one, 
really, really good advice I got was if you don't, if you find a bug or something, just file a bug and someone will actually have a look on it, probably. And you will learn a lot of that. Uh, you can propose your use case because usually is that you want to do a super complex use case that no one would think of doing and it can be a feature in the, pro in the project. Uh, also, then uh, after like a while of like three years of just filling bugs, I could actually make one pack. So, and it took me one hour. It takes a lot of time. Like if you're looking for something else, it took, takes a lot of time. And uh, you learn a lot from the projects you contribute to. Just by reading the documentation, uh, trying to learn how to use it, all those things. So, uh, all those things matter. Uh, remember to basically uh, have a minimum viable product, else you will just don't want to continue with your side projects. And uh, don't use uh, async IO and threads, because that's not a sync, that's just threads, uh, unless you, your library doesn't support it. Uh, I did like how I usually do things, no functions, then I passed every, dividing everything to functions, then modules, then packages. Uh, try to use Flake from the very beginning. Uh, yeah, fixtures, they are fantastic, use them. And uh, remember to have same defaults. It's horrible when you clone a, a project from GitHub and you cannot run it because there is something missing. And yeah, and that's everything, basically. Thank you very much. Excellent. <laughs> so maybe uh, stay with me one moment, Xavi. Maybe you wondered what I gave to the nice gentleman. It's a voucher for a kayak trip, which every speaker is also entitled to. Do you want? Yes. Yeah. Larry, <laughs> kayak trip uh, tonight? It's at uh, oh, it's se uh, 7 o'clock tonight. OK. So every speaker is entitled, to, you can set up your laptop. Every speaker is entitled to get one of those, but he has to be present at, uh, what? I showed the wrong side, yeah. Because I have to read what's on it. So, <laughs> play blank check, yeah, blank check. You can draw blank on those uh, things. I don't know the word, bla draw blank, what it was ever. Anyway. Uh, the speakers are entitled to one kayak trip. It will start at 7 o'clock, 1900 military time at the reception. Leave your electronics at home. <laughs> and I have uh, something like nine registered lightning talks. Larry skipped out, so that's eight. One I gave away. So something around 10 more vouchers are with me. And there'll be riddles between the talks where you can win a voucher for a kayak trip. Our next speaker, Daniel, about Python adventures in Namibia. Give him a big hand. So, if you've been to any Python or Django conferences in the last few years, you'll have heard me talking about uh, our plans, plans to initiate new PyCons in African countries. And I'm very pleased because it has turned into a reality. And this January, we went back to Namibia for the second time for an international Python conference, PyCon Namibia 2016. So there's uh, Namibia. Um, with its population of just over 2 million people, it's the third least densely populated country in the world. It's very easy to get to you, just go towards South Africa and turn right before you get there. Um, so our venue was the University of Namibia in Windhoek, the, the capital. We had 180, 18 attendees, half of whom were women, with visitors, with attendees from South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Nigeria, all in Africa, the UK, Netherlands, Germany, Canada, USA, and Brazil. So from all over the world. Uh, 63 of our attendees were Namibian students, including a number of high school pupils and 32 Django girls. We had a four-day program, first of introductory talks and workshops, including the Django girls, to help people get started. Two days of talks in two tracks, and then some more advanced uh, workshops. 
there were some challenges in setting this up, of course, because the economy in that whole region is struggling, uh, has been in a difficult situation for some time. So trying to budget for a conference where, for example, the price of a very good meal um, is, represents maybe half of somebody's monthly disposable income. So if you imagine the difficulties in trying to set prices for tickets. Um, we, in fact, were able to ensure that all the Namibian students who came, came to the conference without needing to pay um, anything. Um, we had a lot of help from uh, our partners in the University of Namibia, Cardiff University in the UK, the Django Society UK. But here I especially want to mention the Python Software Foundation. We're hugely grateful for the financial support that they gave. Uh, a very decent amount of money to support this and made a lot of things possible. So the PSF really is helping make a difference in the world. So thank you to the PSF uh, for that. Um, we had sponsors from Europe uh, as well, from South Africa, and really happily this year for us, actually local Namibian sponsors, which really means something about the involvement of local uh, business in this. We took a pre-configured Pi Lab of 50 Raspberry Pis funded by the PSF and Cardiff University, so it's a bit difficult to find the right equipment sometimes. I uh, had some interesting conversations at airports. You know, what's in this computer, sir? Um, it's 50 computers for a conference. <laughs> so, no, no, really, it's 50 computers for a conference. <laughs> um, here's one of the workshops on the first day. You can see a couple of the school kids there being helped by one of the uh, students from uh, the University of Namibia. The Django Girls, again, one of the school girls. The Django Girls workshop there spawned further um, uh, Django Girls workshops um, elsewhere. It wasn't just Python, we had local developers of uh, PHP and Java, people who just wanted to be involved in open source and, and what we were doing came along and stayed for the conference to find about Python and just be involved in uh, it. Uh, we made a big splash in Namibia, we were on the newspapers, television and radio here, uh, uh, Jessica from Namibia and Vincent from Cardiff being interviewed on the radio. I was on um, uh, Namibian television, as you can see it says, I am in fact Python software. <laughs> This was our program of talks. You can see it's a pretty packed uh, program in two tracks with people from all over the world speaking. So that was, it was a proper um, PyCon. This is the most diverse lineup of lightning talks I've ever seen. <laughs> and it really stand, represents the conference uh, uh, for me. Uh, of course, we had a different kind of lightning talk. Here's uh, uh, Gabrielle explaining how to stay safe while you take your tourist selfie with the hippos in the background. <laughs> Here's Samuel, one of the UNAM students um, who presented some really interesting work. Lots of interesting uh, outcomes. PyNAM, the Namibian Python Society, working with schools and students, Django Girls all over Africa. Other Pi African PyCons are being uh, worked on by people uh, who were there. And um, we did have a hitch. Student protests hit the conference um, over registration fees. So we, were pos we had to um, postpone one of the days by a day. People said, welcome to Africa, but Africa's not the only place where people have protests or the only conference that gets disrupted <laughs> at all, by any means. But when we realized what had happened, it took us 45 minutes to arrange a new venue for 118 people and a two-track conference. So that's, things really can get done. I only had... Um, uh, very uh, 48 hours of free time. I took a road trip down to the coast through this amazing, amazing <laughs> landscapes, through things that <laughs> were really special. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, if you're interested, I'm doing a talk tomorrow on artificial intelligence. Will you, you join us in the water? Oh, n not in the water, thanks. Not I'm in the water. A, not a, in the water. A desert man. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the guys in California have Silicon Valley. <laughs> they have silicon all over the desert. So, anyway, Alexander told me that uh, there are some online things where you can rate your talks, your visitor today, your sessions. 
Has anybody already rated the session in the EuroPython application? Yeah, one winner. <laughs> do we have another winner who already rated a talk? And while I do stupid things, I can get, please, Tom, uh, Radomir, Radomir, can you please set up your system? Okay, so another question. How many robots does it take to change a light bulb? None. None is a creative answer. Who was it with none? <laughs> you were none. You, you already... Uh, ah, why none? Because it's a robot. That's good enough to win a ticket. <laughs> Can you give it in the back side? Uh, yesterday we were preparing for the show this morning and I thought, how many robots does this take? One robot for all the light bulbs. All your light bulbs are belong to us. <laughs> anyway, give a big hand to Radomir. He will be talking about win fabulous prizes and you know what our fabulous prizes are. Radomir. So you've seen the, probably you've seen the keynote about uh, MicroPython on the microbit, but uh, MicroPython really works on a lot of different platforms. And one platform in particular is very interesting. It was released, the port was uh, basically rewritten this year, also as a result of Kickstarter. And it's this board. It's basically the size of a pop stamp. It costs about three dollars, uh, sometimes less if you if you order in bulk. It's called uh, ESP8266, and it has Wi-Fi on it, so it can connect to the internet. So it's a pretty cool thing, and uh, the MicroPython community for that particular board is uh, growing no right now. So I thought I will make a contest uh, to encourage this growth even more. So uh, it's on the hackaday.io website and you can, uh, and you can basically build anything you want, uh, any cool project using this uh, microcontroller and using MicroPython on it. And I will basically choose the project that I like the most and that person will win uh, another MicroPython board. This one is uh, slightly more expensive. It has a camera and it has built in uh, a lot of uh, image processing uh, function on it. It's called OpenMV and it's a very cool project that you can use to make your robots track faces or make, uh, uh, I don't know, a camera for your drone that automatically tells you where you are by observing the ground and seeing how it moves or uh, a lot of other things. So I have an extra one from Kickstarter and uh, I will basically send it to the person who wins this contest. So that's that. And uh, so if, if you are interested in tin tinkering, that's certainly something to try. And also I want people here on the conference to try uh, installing uh, and playing with MicroPython a little bit more. So we could uh, do that at the maker, space, maker area back in the uh, conference, maybe today evening after the lightning talks and maybe some other day. Just check, check there. I, I have a box of cool stuff with me so we can try to connect some wires and so on. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Radomir. Excellent. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Who thinks she is a winner? She is a winner, cool. He's a winner. <laughs> <laughs> we don't discriminate by, uh, can you give, pass it back to it? Cool. We don't discriminate. Um, <laughs> if, if I ask she is a winner and a man raises it, we had uh, uh, Naomi going through all the troubles to raise a number of uh, women in the Python community. She told me she changed her sex to get it. So 
We don't discriminate, we do it if we ask a question. So, one thing more. Have you heard about those stories um, when Google bought deep learning and they made the computer play Go? It's wonderful, it's wonderful. I just was thinking, who is giving directions to those developers? I have never woken up in the morning and thought, hmm, it would be so nice if I would have a machine to play Go for me. I would be fun if they do my dishes, wash the bathroom, do my text things, but what do they spend their time on? Playing Go. <laughs> what will be the next? A robot playing golf better than me, which is easy. <laughs> Why? So, submit to the Borg. Oh, the Borg. What is the <laughs> Borg? What is the Borg? You will be assimilated. <laughs> That's one explanation. You get only. What is the Borg? What? Borg is a backup solution. So you, you have somebody you can share? No? Another explanation for Borg. Think of Alex Martelli. The Python Singleton pattern. Give a big hand to this guy. <laughs> Python Singleton pattern by Dr. Alex Martelli. Who was it with the Singleton pattern? Ah, okay, he already got his ticket. Great. <laughs> okay, Borg back up. Thomas Waldmann, give him a big hand. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to present this uh, backup solution to you. Uh, the phrase in the middle is from a guy uh, on Twitter. Uh, it's about a year ago he discovered Attic, uh, and it's kind of the father project of Borg Backup, and he told, oh, I think I found the holy grail of backup software. So it also applies to Borg. Uh, what is Borg? Um, about a year ago I forked the Attic project. So it's not a new project. Maybe you don't want to use really new backup software, but it's six years old. Um, why did we fork it? It's because the development of the original project was rather slow and pull requests did not get merged. And also the original author was not very open to new developers and so on. So it was a bit of a pity that it uh, did not proceed as fast as some other people wanted. And so the end was we just forked it. And that was a year ago and since then the community has grown quite a bit. So it's not bus factor one anymore, but there are a few people caring for it. Uh, we have committed a ton of fixes and have merged a lot of pull requests. And also we are inviting to new developers. So if you want to hack on it, just talk to us. And it's a lot faster paced than the original project. Uh, when the fork was done, it was 600 change sets in GitHub. And now we have two and a half thousand change sets. Uh, so the feature set, uh, if you want to make backups, you don't want to invest a lot of time, so you want something easy and it should also go rather fast. Um, also you want some features, for example, you want uh, chunking, uh, that means to cut uh, the file in pieces, uh, and it will also deduplicate these chunks, so it won't store anything uh, twice, so you can save a lot of space. We also have compression, the usual compression algorithms. LZ4 is very fast. We do encryption with AES, and also on top of that encryption, we sign the stuff so uh, nobody can toggle some bits or try to uh, break the encryption. The backend is either file system or to a remote server via SSH. It's free and open software. We have good documentation, platform support, and architectures is quite good. It runs on Intel, AMD, ARM, 32-bit, uh, 64-bit, basically on almost everything. Uh, it also supports special stuff like extended attributes, ACLs, BSD flags. You can mount your backups with a fused file system, so you can look directly inside and copy some files out of it. It runs on Python 3.4 or upwards. And for the speed, we have a little bit of Cython and C. We have good test coverage and continuous integration system. Uh, some special stuff about the deduplication. 
uh, it's not just like our thing. It's cutting the files into pieces and it has no problems with uh, virtual machine images. It supports sparse files. You can also do whole disk images or logical volume snapshots. You can rename huge directories and they will still get deduplicated. The inner deduplication will work in a data set, also historical deduplication and also deduplication between different machines even. How is it working? It cuts the file into pieces. It rolls a hash over the file and every time the least significant bits of the hash are zero, it says, okay, I cut here, I cut there, and so on. And these pieces will get hashed and stored into a key value store uh, using the hash as ID. So you can see uh, every piece that gets the same hash is, is just stored once. Uh, the hash function is also seeded, so you can do fingerprinting attacks or something like that. So it's also quite secure. If you have encryption active, it will not use a hash, but HMAC, so there is a secret key going into it, so it's safe. Uh, 1.0 is released. You can get it from different sources, Ubuntu, Debian, whatsoever. Uh, soon we'll release 1.1 with some new features, and 1.2 is the next bigger change. We will introduce some new crypto stuff and also try to uh, parallelize more. Currently, it's uh, single-threaded. Um, also, it will get faster in 1.2. AES GCM is a bit faster than the current stuff. And yeah, there will be an open space meeting. Just look at the board and also sprint. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Thomas. Okay, open space on it. You won another ticket, if you like. Uh, no, 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 okay. <laughs> so, Lasse Schürmann, could you please set up? And Lasse? Ah, here you are. Now I need 10 volunteers to come to play in kayak. Okay, we have three volunteers, four volunteers, five, six, seven. Okay, uh, can somebody help me? Can, can you please distribute those? I take away four for the speakers. And Alexander will drop his laptop and distribute them. Okay, all the volunteers for the kayak trip at 7 o'clock this night, raise your arm. Oh, that's, that's fine, that will work out. We have there. Alexander, on the right side, we have many people on the left side. <laughs> Make yourself known, Alexander. Yeah, he's moving around. Great. Okay. Very good. <coughs> so while he is distributing them, I had something I was thinking about. If a group of people tries to leave another group of people, you call them separatists. If you have an, a group of people who wants to stay with a group of people, you call them unionists. What do you call a group of people who want to leave another group of people to stay with another group? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I would call him Scottish. Anyway, <laughs> our next talker, uh, speaker is Lasse Schürmann. Schürmann, that sounds, sounds German. I'm from Germany, yeah. You're from Germany, yeah. Schürmann. Very nice <laughs> spelling. Koala, lint and fix all the code. Give him a big hand. Thank you. Okay, I want to tell you about a project. I'm so excited that I'm currently spending 30 to 40 hours a week in my free time on it. So I want to tell you about the Koala project. And Koala is a tool that finds problems in your source code and it can fix them as well. So you've probably heard about a lot of those tools. To explain how it's different, let me ask you a question. Would you want to rewrite LibreOffice just to get a spelling correction for Portuguese? Please raise your hand. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Uh, so I wouldn't. And let's take a look at the world of static code analysis. 
we do have a lot of different tools. If we look at Python only, we have Radon, uh, Autopip 8, and PyDoc style, whatever. There is a plethora of tools, and as a user, you have to learn six tools to cover only one language, and as a developer, you always have to write a new tool, which is just redundancy. It is work that you don't need to do. And on the other side, we have the user who wants to use the code analysis in his editor plugin, in the command line, maybe in his continuous integration, or directly in GitHub. For research, he wants to have a JSON output and all that. And for most small tools, you don't have that because they don't have the time to provide all those integrations. So naturally, we would have to connect all our tools with all those use cases. And still the user would have to learn lots of, lots of tools. So let's put an API in between them. And we call this API Koala, which is the code analysis application. Um, Koala has currently code analysis for 54 programming languages. So how do we do that? Our goal is to reduce redundancy. So we allow you to write static code analysis for Koala without writing a new tool. But we don't want to create new redundancy, so we don't duplicate the existing code analysis. We just wrap existing tools in addition to what we have. Um, there is, uh, sorry, uh, adaptive talk. Um, there is also a tool, uh, Gitmate, which can automatically review your GitHub pull requests using Koala, because Koala just provides the API. Uh, after this talk, I want you to try out Koala if you haven't yet. I want you to tell us especially what you don't like about it so we can improve it. We have an active community. We actually have eight people for this project here at EuroPython, and we will have a sprint. Please join us at the sprint. Everybody who solves a low difficulty issue gets a Steam key for free. And last but not least, I want you to keep your passion about programming, about open source software, and drive this community forward. You're great. Keep doing it. If you have any questions, we actually do have one and a half minutes for it. No, it's okay, it's like we talk. Oh, cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Austin. You? <coughs> good turn off? Uh, I think so. Cool. You're winner. Mike, you can. I need Tuna Vagi on the stage. Tuna? Very good, very good. So, who has heard of test based development? We had very, or test driven development, even better. We, we had very bad experiences in Germany lately. There were developers of car engines, they developed for tests. And the people in the US were very mad about it. So, <laughs> be careful with test driven development. Don't obey the testing goat. So you are on the cool argument. Yeah. Argument. Oh, he'll get help. He'll get help. Oh, cool. Argument and open source argument mapping platform, which only work with UTF-8. Give him a big hand. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, is anybody heard of? Argument org before? No, not many. Only I see one or two hands. Okay, Argument uh, is a open source argument mapping platform. Uh, what is Argument? It is a, a Turkish synonym of the word argument. Uh, yeah, I'm Turkish. So, uh, Argument is an open source collaborative argument mapping and analysis platform. So, what is this? What is argument mapping first? It's a visual representation of uh, critical thinking. So it's a d basically discussion platform, but uh, visually a little bit different than uh, conventional discussion platforms. It looks like this. So you have an argument like you see uh, in the up and 
there are some premises uh, because because these are s uh, two supporting premises uh, to this argument, and there's a how however premise uh, under, which is a kind of a supporting uh, premise for the one before, uh, the one here up. These are both fruits, for example. Apples and oranges can be compared, and this guy support. They he say that they are both fruits and. This guy say that while they must, uh, they m both be a fruit, round, uh, derived from the same taxonomy, and blah, blah. Uh, so this is another, uh, so this is a tree structure, as you can see. So there's a, uh, the, uh, somebody come. Also, you can be, uh, you can log into the platform and uh, just enter your argument if you have any. So. AI should not be slay, uh, enslaved, for example, and this guys start to discuss about that. And these are, these are, for example, opposition premises. Uh, the guy say no, and this guy say supporting argument to this no. And after all, you, you see here's a conclusion: 81% objection rate. We calculate this ob uh, objection rate with an algorithm, and. Basically, this, uh, for example, plants should have the uh, right to vote, and this is a supporter premise for argument, and this is an objective, uh, yeah, uh, and this is uh, another argument, for example, and this is however promise. <laughs> So there, there are also fallacies defined. So if something has no uh, argument value, for example, uh, like this, you say this, this is a fallacy. Don't do that. And these, uh, after some point, these fallacies make this argument invisible. So because it's not an argument, uh, like this. And we closed on down bridge. It is kind of a scene, but like almost invisible. So uh, this is the objection rate, uh, right, uh, rate like or supporting rate. We calculate this to the uh, value of the premises. And there's also semantic network between arguments. We kind of use the WordNet for getting the, uh, like uh, getting the words from this uh, argument and teaching them into the platform. And after some while, we know which word we mean which, and we categorize them automatically. So uh, like this. And after a while, you say that AI is belong to this artificial intelligence category, uh, and is a, is a computer science. It's under computer science, and blah, blah. As you can see, you can check the platform. And right now, it's. Uh, supported in four languages, Turkish, English, Chinese, and French. Uh, it's an open source platform. You can contribute whatever, whenever you want. Whether, uh, this English, chi no, we did the English part, but this Chinese and French is translated uh, like open with uh, support of open source uh, guys. Now development is, th this address you can find the GitHub, uh, the repository. Uh, there. 600, uh, uh, I updated this today. So these are the statistics and, uh, no, just an old slide. Um, so what we use, Python, Django, TextBlob, and LTK, and Unidecode, and Nginx, Gunicom, PostgreSQL, MongoDB, and WordNet for Lexical Dictionary. <laughs> so you can find it. Thank you so very much, Tuna yeah. and Fatih. Yeah. You can find them on GitHub, you can like them on Facebook, you can follow them on Twitter. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. You will join us? Maybe. Uh, if not, find somebody who will join us. Okay. okay, cool. Harry, can you please come up? Wonderful, wonderful. You you need a microphone. You don't have a loud noise uh, voice. We have a microphone here. We'll switch it on. Look at this old man. 
Yeah, he'll take five minutes to come on stage, so. Okay, I'm just coming. It's just, you know, all this conference going where he does my back in. You have to sit down and you stand up and, you know, you have to get to the talks and you lie in an uncomfortable bed in a cheap hostel. And gosh, I wish there was some sort of solution to all the stress that we have from programming, fixing other people's bugs, fixing most annoying of all your own bugs. And, you know, some way of de-stressing after all the programming and also maybe making a donation to the PSF. Well, thankfully, you'll be pleased to hear that there is a solution to this problem. As every year, normally organized by Rob Collins, there are charity massages going to happen this year in the name of the PSF. So uh, Fabian here and myself will be going around giving away free massages, and you can give a donation and get a massage. You can also give a donation if you don't want to receive a massage and you would like to avoid it. <laughs> That is also the important thing, is the donation. Uh, so if you'd like to help with that, it's a charity collection for the PSF. We're going to be collecting that money um, at the social event on Tuesday and during lunch slots. So we'll be training anyone who wants to volunteer and help give out massages or um, uh, uh, mug people into giving money to not get a massage. We'll, we'll train you in a professional massage course in the course of about 15 or 20 minutes. Professional massage course given by entirely professional masseurs. Um, and that will be happening tomorrow in the lunch break immediately as lunch starts. So because there are long queues for lunch, if some people want to come and learn massages, we'll spend 20 minutes doing that. And by the time we've all learned to give massages, we will, there'll be no more queue and we'll be able to have lunch. So that is the message. So free massages for the PSF. Come and learn how to do it um, in the lunch break tomorrow, immediately as the lunch break starts. And we'll be round the corner here outside the pie charm room with the lovely view over the river. So it'll be de-stressful already, de-stressing already. How about that? So that's the idea. PSF Thank you very massage. much. Woo! One, more huh? one more thing, one more thing. Oh. I, have, I have one more message. Uh, walking around the conference, you may see some people wearing badges. I, for example, am wearing a badge with a little snail on it, and the badge says, I'm a beginner mentor asking me anything. There are also some people running around with similar badges that have a little python snake on them, and those uh, badges says, I'm a beginner, be nice. So there's a surprising number of beginners at these Python conferences. Uh, and the people with beginner mentor badges have said they are entirely happy. I mean, everyone in this room is happy to answer questions from beginners. But people wearing these badges are saying, look, if you're a beginner, if you have a, what you think is maybe a stupid question, these people have just said, look, I am totally happy to stop what I'm doing, stop my conversation that I'm having right now, and answer any, sh any questions you may have. Up to and including, like, where is the bathroom? What time is the next talk? But, you know, you have questions about a talk you just saw. You feel like uh, everybody must know the answer to this, but I'm stupid, so I don't. Um, uh, we're Woo! here to answer them. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. And I have to ask you right. for an extra applause because I'm restricting myself from the using the words happy and I'm also restricting myself from using the word ending after that presentation about, about a massage course. So please give me a big applause for my restriction to keep this conference civil. I'm not using that word. Excellent. Michel, you will be talking about, yeah, right. thanks for the Python 3. Oh. Can you help him with the thing? I have not enough chokes to get this uh, projector running. So I, I tried this before, it was working. Right yeah, now. yeah. <laughs> I'm hearing this story since 2006. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, I've been uh, to, oh, great, great, great. So while he's figuring out uh, how to destroy it again. Um, I've been to many conferences. I always met the guys from MongoDB, and I was so jealous because they had money to burn for marketing and everything. Oh. Doesn't want to be good. No, okay, don't worry. I will be. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hearing that for 20 years. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Just press close. Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> I cannot even reduce this. I can't even. <laughs> I can just add more. I got to be close. <laughs> <laughs> One more left. <laughs> no, this oh, that, that, that's the video. Down. That's a new game. Okay. That's like <laughs> Don't worry. Hit the close fast okay, enough. Okay, I, I will talk. Mikael, so give him a big hand. <laughs> yeah.
So this talk is not prepared, so we'll take less than five minutes. Probably with two minutes will be enough. But I, I couldn't say, because all I want to say now is thanks to these guys here, which are the scientific Python community, essentially the people uh, are doing the IPython, Jupyter, and all the scientific stuff. Because in this Python 3 statement that I discovered just uh, three days ago, they, they state that now because the reason why I discovered this is that I was checking, checking if IPython 5 was out or not. And it was out and also they were telling that this was the last version to support Python 2.7. So the next major version of IPython will be Python 3 only. And not only that, they made this uh, Python 3 statement that a number of scientific projects are signing this statement, saying that essentially, well before 2020, as, as, a, as you know, 2020 is the end of the life, uh, at, at least officially, it's the official end of the life of Python. We, we know that it will continue for the next 50 years, but uh, officially the Python Software Foundation will not support anymore Python after 2020, but these guys here, the scientific guys, they will remove the support before 2020. And for that, for that I thank them, certainly, okay, because I don't need to wait for other four hours, for, for years, because, you know, I, an old time, old time Python program, I started more than 10 years ago. So I remember the time when there was the mythical Python 3000, okay, it was not even called 3.0 at the time, it was, mythical Python 3000, it, wo it came out in 2008, we are now in 2016, and I still I couldn't never program professionally in Python 3. Now, after this, I think I probably in the, in, in the um, autumn, no, I mean, I think within this year I will probably switch to Python 3 because I work as a scientific programmer the scientists, uh, they, they work with, with us, uh, I'm in the DIT uh, group, but the scientists are using IPython, the IPython notebook now called Jupyter, every day. So they, they need always the latest version of IPython, so this is good reason for us to migrate. And this was good for me because I, I'm just in the, more than the middle, I, am, I already done the first 80% of the migration to Python 3 of our core software. And now the, also the time that will have to change all their notebooks, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm happy because I started the work and now I can say, look, I told you that it was the right time to do that. So uh, really happy about that. Uh, I don't know in the, in the business community, probably in the enterprise programming, probably you will have not this luck and we will continue for few years. But uh, I see that the tide has changed. And now essentially all the, the scientific software I used has been already ported to Python 3. So uh, we will also do the migration and I see that everybody can sign here this agree agreement, uh, this uh, statement, sorry. And uh, maybe we will also sign this when, but we need to have a plan uh, with dates and say you know, we, our software will stop supporting Python 2 within this data, this I, I don't know when. So, but uh, this is a good thing. Another thing I will talk on, on Friday here and uh, everybody who is interested in uh, scientific Python, uh, high performance computing in Python, uh, cluster, uh, distributed computing, et cetera, et cetera, can talk to me and I'm available. Thank you very much, Michel. <laughs> Will you join us? No? no? Okay. That nearly concludes today's lightning talks. One announcement tomorrow. Harry, can you please stand up? Uh, after he spammed you with massages, he will presenting tomorrow lightning talk. Please give him a big hand. Ooh. And if somebody still is available at seven o'clock, okay, the young fellow behind there, he just uh, come in front at the end of the thing. Join us in the lightning talk. So those who will join us, leave your electronics at home, especially you, Radomir, if you want to sell them. Leave them at home. Come in something that can get wet. And 
Enjoy your evening. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>